Good. So uh, as we were saying, one way of classifying organic molecules is using these three terms that you see here, acyclic, carbocyclic, and heterocyclic. And as you might be able to guess, just the term cyclic refers to both carbocyclic and heterocyclic. As you can imagine, just from the words, a compound must be either cyclic or acyclic. There's no other possibility. But acyclic compounds, and we've seen a lot of them so far, are ones that don't contain any rings of atoms. And a ring of atoms is exactly what it sounds like. And we'll look at some examples of that. And you know, anything like pentane, uh, anything branched like this guy over here, that's acyclic. It can have other atoms in it as well. Maybe we've got ourselves a methyl ether over here, something like that. That would also be an acyclic compound. So anything that does not have any rings of atoms in it, is an acyclic compound. And it, it can be just a hydrocarbon or it can contain other atoms as well. Carbocyclic compounds are those that have rings that contain only carbon. And those carbons may have single or double bonds. Uh, can you have a triply bonded carbon in a ring? Uh, good question. Answer is yes, but the ring is to be really big. You don't run into these at all commonly. Because, uh, again, I asked you guys to review about hybridization. And if you look at a carbon that's involved in a triple bond, then you'll see that carbon has to be sp hybridized. And sp hybridized atoms are linear. So it is to include this fairly lengthy linear piece somehow. So you need a pretty huge ring to accommodate that. So you don't really, f uh, you don't really find cycloalkynes. I've certainly never run into one in the wild. I can't think of one anyway. Um, interesting and rare exceptions, by the way, include some antibiotic and anti-tumor agents. So I won't say they never occur. They're just rare. But uh, a carbocyclic compound can be something like cyclohexane, which we'll talk a little bit about. It can be cyclobutane, which is kind of the same and kind of different in other ways. Um, uh, oh, you know what? I think I need to mute the chat. I, only I can remember how to do that. Uh, no, maybe it's under chat. No, it's been a while. Maybe they'll mute themselves. Oh, participants, that's right, thank you. Participants, no, uh, mute all, there we go. Good, good. Thank you for refreshing my memory. So uh, talking about carbocyclic compounds, one we've already seen is benzene, which we're going to do a whole chapter on benzene and related compounds. So that's still a carbocyclic compound. And by the way, you can put whatever functional groups you want on these, whatever heteroatoms you like. We would still have to call those carbocyclic because the ring contains only carbon or carbon and hydrogen. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, rings are certainly, it's certainly allowed for rings to contain other atoms. And you could have, for instance, this cyclic five-membered ether. A uh, compound happens to be called tetrahydrofuran. I don't think I really care if you memorize that. As I said, I like to mention names of compounds as I draw them because they do have names. And in my experience, people are curious what things are called. Uh, or, you know, you can have a couple different atoms in it. You could have something like this. I think that guy is called morpholine. You could have multiple bonds if you like. Uh, as long as there's some, at, at least one atom other than carbon uh, incorporated into the ring, you've got yourself a heterocyclic compound, or you can just say the compound's a heterocycle. That's also allowed. We're even going to do a whole chapter in heterocycles. Brand new this term. So that's one way of classifying organic compounds is whether they're cyclic or, or acyclic. And if they are cyclic, whether they're carbocyclic or heterocyclic. So that's one way. And uh, it's, it, it again comes naturally to us organic chemists to use these terms. So I think it's good for uh, you guys to learn them as well, just so you understand uh, what we're talking about, like, in uh, what I'm talking about in my lecture or the authors of your book are talking about in the book. That's the basic idea behind it. Uh, even more commonly used, if anything, is this idea of functional groups. And I still have 40 minutes. And if I can spend half an hour on electron configurations, you can, 
darn well that I could spend 40 minutes on uh, functional groups. In fact, I'm, I don't want to rush it, but I, I just want to fit all of the major ones in. So uh, I would say uh, if I had to give uh, a definite, well, I've defined functional group in your class notes, but if I had to define a, a fun what a functional group is, uh, I would say it's a, gr a certain group of atoms or a certain set of atoms that are always bonded together in a certain way. That when we see them, we can predict the molecule that contains them will have certain properties because of having that functional group. In fact, if I had to, I'll, I'll write that down in just a second, but if I had to summarize in one sentence what one of the main things I want you all to get out of this class is, it would be that structure determines function. If I had to put in just a few words why chemistry matters, that's why. Structure determines function. The reason that molecules do what they do is because of their structure. And uh, that's actually a relatively recent level of understanding that we've had say within the last 150 years or something like that, we really began to understand structure. So started before my time, but if, if you can believe that there ever was a time before my time, but there was, hard as it is to believe. Good, so I would say a functional group is a set of atoms bonded a certain way that implies, how's that, a certain reactivity or set of behaviors when we see them in a molecule. And that's what we're going to learn is what all of these, what uh, at least all of the relevant functional groups are for us. Now, there are hundreds of functional groups. You're certainly not going to learn or have to learn all of them. But there are, eh, I don't know, I haven't counted them, about a dozen, I would say, that are so common that it just is impossible to move forward without mentioning them and learning what they are. Uh, before I actually get into the functional groups, I do want to say there is a table of the functional groups you'll need to know in your textbook. I will go over at least most of them in class. I might miss a couple depending on time. Uh, but those will be the ones you'll need to know. That being said, I do not recommend that you just flat out memorize that table. I, I mean, you can, it might be a start, but I would say the level of understanding you need to aim for is beyond merely memorizing all of the pictures in the table. Uh, so I don't know that it's really necessarily a very, ooh, I just realized, sin unto me, I forgot my lone pears. <gasps> I have sinned. There we go, that's better. We can leave CO2H alone since that's an abbreviation for a carboxylic acid functional group. I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't notice until I looked up at the screen. I'm like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> so like I said, I'll hold myself to it too. We'll use the, we'll, we'll put in all, we'll be careful to put in all of the non-bonding lone pairs, let's say at least through the first exam. And I'll hold myself to that as well. So like I was saying, uh, I don't recommend merely flat out memorizing that table. You can do it if you want to. I question whether it's a particularly great use of your time. So uh, I'm going to present the functional groups a little bit differently uh, or, or, uh, than in the book, or maybe in a way that includes the information in the book, but I hope explains it a little better. Like I said, I'm gonna be adding one or two little things to what uh, I usually do, and we'll see how it we'll see how it goes across. Good. So um, before we really get into functional groups, uh, let's take care of the different types of hydrocarbons. And I would say that hydrocarbons exist in roughly four different flavors. I've already mentioned a couple of them. First of all, the alkane functional group, or I, I, I really actually actually hesitate to call alkanes a functional group. I would say if a molecule is an alkane, like pentane or this molecule over here, pretty soon we'll learn that that guy is called 2,5-dimethylhexane. So we will learn how to name things like this. But I would say alkanes like those molecules, rather than that they contain the alkane functional group, I'm not so sure that alkane is a functional group. 
I think that alkanes are almost described as molecules that have no functional groups. But another way of describing alkanes that you might help find helpful is an alkane is a molecule that contains only carbon hydrogen and carbon carbon single bonds. And nothing else. So really, as such, it lacks all functional groups because carbon-carbon single bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds are very unreactive, which is a good thing for us. That, that is why the chemistry of life as we understand it is based on carbon, because you can get these large, not just alkenes, but large stable molecules that, that are built on carbon. And it's like I said, that's why uh, I'm no cosmologist, but my understanding nowadays from, from my extensive history of watching YouTube videos is that uh, any sort of conceivable life in the universe, if there is life on other planets, almost certainly is going to be based in carbon, just like we are. Good. So, an, but an alkane is any molecule of that type, and I've already drawn two of them over there. There's one. There's another, uh, these uh, cyclic alkanes exist. You can also call them cycloalkanes, uh, but they, they really belong at least broadly in the same class. These are molecules that don't have any oxygen, don't have any nitrogen, don't have any, don't even have any multiple bonds, don't have any functional groups as such. So I only mention this because for whatever reason, I'm not entirely comfortable calling the alkane a functional group. To me, it really more means there are no functional groups. Maybe that's kind of a distinction without a difference. I don't know. That's just sort of my interpretation of the matter based on my experience. There are other hydrocarbon functional groups. And you will have already guessed, by the way, what does hydrocarbon mean? Hydrocarbon means exactly what it sounds like. Hydrocarbons are species that contain only carbon and hydrogen and nothing else. So hydrocarbons contain only carbon and hydrogen. Uh, the first one that I think we really do have to call a functional group is the alkene functional group. And that's going to be a molecule that contains at least one carbon-carbon double bond. It could have more than one, but it must have at least one. So the simplest alkene would have just two carbons. Whereas the simplest alkene is, of course, methane. So you can have a one-carbon alkene. You can't have a one-carbon alkene. You need at least two carbons. Uh, that compound happens to be called ethylene. It's the uh, building block for polyethylene. And goodness, how many consumer products do we use that are made of polyethylene on a daily basis? So it's a pretty important molecule. But again, any hydrocarbon that has at least one carbon-carbon double bond, uh, cycloalkenes certainly exist. The ring is to be large enough to accommodate the 120 degree bond angle that we find in sp2 hybridized atoms. Because of course, to accommodate a double bond, those carbons have to be sp2 hybridized. And like I said, the only hybridizations I think you guys are ever going to have to worry about in this class are sp3, sp2, and sp. You don't need any of the exotic ones. We're not doing dsp2 or d2 sp3 or any of those weird ones. Those three hybridizations will suffice for us, I think. Uh, good. So anything that contains at least one double bond is an alkene, but you could have multiple bonds, double bonds. We can have one here and maybe another one coming off the molecule like that. That would that would contain two double bonds. That would still be that would still be uh, that would still be classified as an alkene. If you really wanted to be fancy, you could say it's a diene, die for two. But it certainly would fall into the class of uh, alkenes. Alkynes are another class of hydrocarbons, and they need to con contain at least one carbon-carbon triple bond. And incidentally, while we're kind of on the subject. Quadruple bonds are not a thing, not in organic chemistry. They may exist in some transition metal molecules, but certainly not with carbon. So triple bonds are the limit for us. Uh, and so the simplest alkyne has two carbons. That molecule happens to be called acetylene. You might have heard of an acetylene torch, which is because acetylene burns with an exceedingly hot flame. So people are using it to weld pipes and the like. Uh, but, you know, you can have any number of other carbons. Actually, 
let's even put the triple bond in the middle of the molecule. Something like that would also be an alkyne. I don't know why. I actually could have left out the letter Cs and it would still have been a perfectly adequate structure. I just, for some reason, like drawing them in with alkynes. That's just my personal preference. If you would rather leave the letter Cs out and just show that triple bond in between, that's perfectly fine, absolutely correct. That's just sort of my personal way of drawing molecules. I find it a little easier to see. But if you'd rather just go full line angle drawings, go for it, nothing wrong with it. And last but not least, uh, you have arenes, also called aromatic compounds, same thing. And I think it's best for our purposes to define aromatic compounds as containing at least one benzene ring, benzene itself being uh, the simplest possible aromatic compounds. You'll notice I'm hedging my words a little bit. Are there other aromatic compounds besides benzene? Yes, the answer is yes. Are we gonna run into them? I very much doubt it. They don't occur nearly as often as benzene does. Uh, though we might run into a couple of them in the heterocycles chapter, but I don't think that's gonna be a huge problem for us. Benzene is sort of the typical aromatic compound. So any, uh, and I, I think I've already said this, I sometimes like to abbreviate benzene rings with the circle. You may do the same uh, if, you, if you like that. If you don't like it and would rather draw using one of these other resonance forms, that's also perfectly acceptable. Only, and I think I said this, I'll just let you guys know, in OWL and also on, on our exams, uh, I think you'll see benzene drawn like this because I don't have a good way of drawing a benzene ring with a circle like that in the software that I use. So I usually have no choice but to draw them like that. But put whatever you like on a benzene ring, you've still got an aromatic compound. Maybe it's even an alkyl benzene. Maybe it's a benzene ring with some other functional group on it. Like, I don't know, maybe an aldehyde. Call that molecule benzaldehyde if you like. And uh, we'll prob I'll probably have a couple comments on benzaldehyde when we get to the aldehyde functional group but those would also be aromatic compounds. So uh, those are all of the possible situations that we'll run into that, uh, that apply to hydrocarbons. Those are basically the four types of hydrocarbons. And I'm comfortable calling alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic rings uh, functional groups. I think that definition worked for them. I'm a little less comfortable calling the alkanes or calling alkanes molecules with functional groups. To me, it's really more like they lack all functional groups. They don't have any, any kind of functionality on them at all. That's how it seems to me. Like I said, maybe it's a distinction without a difference, but that's how it seems to me. Good, any questions so far then? Because after this, we start putting in hetero atoms. Hetero from the, uh, I think, is it Greek uh, root meaning different? And so you see already how prejudiced we organic chemists are towards carbon, because you've got carbon and then you've got heteroatoms, which is everything else, or at least everything else besides carbon and hydrogen. So all of your other atoms are, we call them heteroatoms. And uh, I don't have my periodic table up today, but I think you'll find the most common heteroatoms are going to be oxygen and nitrogen, maybe sulfur once in a while, but those are by far the most common ones. Good, so uh, let's then get into our functional groups. Uh, the first one I'd like to start with is the alcohol functional group. And I have three spelling pet peeves with functional groups. I know I'm not grading your spelling directly, but I'm going to tell you about them anyway. <laughs> pet peeve number one with functional groups. There is only one H in alcohol, please and thank you. It is not alcohol. Oh, that bothers me. Anyway, alcohols are an oxygen containing functional group. They basically uh, are species that contain, and we use these R groups quite a bit, that contain OH, 
OH needs to be attached to an sp3 hybridized carbon, or at least a hydrocarbon type carbon. And you'll notice quite a bit we use these R's when we're describing functional, group, functional groups. You can think of R as being like X in algebra. Sorry, I mentioned math. I said there wouldn't be any math in this class. Last mention of algebra, I think. But it's like X in algebra, meaning it can stand in for any hydrocarbon group. But uh, for alcohols, we need to make sure that this hydrocarbon group uh, it, or we need to make sure that this R group is of a hydrocarbon type, that it's either an alkyl group from an alkane or some other hydrocarbon piece. The reason I'm making that distinction here is, uh, is because, or, or rather you'll see why I'm making that distinction when we get to carboxylic acids, which also contain an OH group, but they are not alcohols, they're different critters. And you'll see, I think you'll see when we get there how to distinguish it. Do be aware that should the OH group be coming off the left side of the molecule, of course, you will write HO. That's the little bit extra that I'm putting in for you guys today. I'm also specifying how to handle it when, uh, when the group comes off the other side of the molecule. Because as you'll notice when you read the class notes, one of the things I said in there is, is what it means to know a functional group. And I don't, I don't promise that I got 100% uh, perfect description of every last tiny bit of what it means to know a functional group. But I would say at the very least, it means recognizing it even in a molecule you've never seen before, no matter which direction it's pointing. So I wanna be sure that you get used to seeing these functional groups on either the left or the right side of the molecule, could be on the top or bottom also. So that's part of what it means to know a functional group. So the simplest possible alcohol is methanol, just one carbon, CH3OH. You do need to have one carbon at least. Uh, if the R group is hydrogen, then you don't have an alcohol, you have water, and water is inorganic. Strange to say that, isn't it? But it's true, water is an inorganic molecule, it doesn't contain carbon. So strange but true. So the smallest possible alcohol is methanol. We already gave the example of ethanol, CH3, CH2OH, or HO, CH2, CH3. That's the next smallest alcohol. That's, uh, that's the one you find in adult beverages. Uh, a slightly larger alcohol is isopropanol. If you go to the store and you buy a bottle of rubbing alcohol, that's what it contains, isopropyl alcohol. But you know the thing can be arbitrarily big. You can have a benzene ring, maybe a couple of these, and maybe over here you've got OH. That would also be an alcohol and an aromatic compound, which brings me to another thing, very common question I get at this point. Can a molecule of multiple functional groups? Absolutely. There can be three, four, six, even more functional groups. So which should we say that is? Should we say that it's an alcohol or an aromatic compound? Answer is it's both. It contains both functional groups. It's absolutely allowed, it's very common in fact, for a molecule to have multiple functional groups. So those are alcohols. Uh, anything that contains that OH group, again, as long as it's attached to a hydrocarbon carbon, you're fine with it being an alcohol. Uh, we'll see that carboxylic acids are a little bit different. Uh, next functional group I wanna go over, and I think you already get the idea for how the rest of this lecture is gonna go. But the next functional group is the ether functional group and I would define that as R1OR2. It's another organic derivative of water. And the only thing we require is that both R1 and R2 be hydrocarbon groups. We can't have either one of them being hydrogen, otherwise you won't have an ether, you'll have an alcohol. So we need both R1 and R2 to be hydrocarbon groups. They can be the same or different. So the smallest possible ether I think would be, happens to be called dimethyl ether, not that I'm really, I really care very much if you memorize that at this point, but that's the smallest possible ether. You need at least two carbons. You might have heard of something called colloquially just ether, and that is actually diethyl ether. But the two R groups can be the same or different. One ether that was used for a while as a gasoline additive is methyl tert-butyl ether, which looks like this. So this type of group will do alkyl groups soon also. That type of group happens to be called a tert butyl group. Butyl because it contains four carbons, one, two, three, four. So that was a gasoline additive for a while to increase the octane rating. Turned out it was un poco toxic. 
and not the greatest thing. In the, I mean, there, there's worse things, but not the greatest thing in the world in terms of the environment. So they started using ethanol, much more common, much less toxic. Uh, ethers can most certainly be cyclic. I drew one on the previous page. Tetrahydrofuran is a cyclic ether, but it still falls into this category. So anything that contains that type of oxygen contained to two hydrocarbon functional groups, and they do have to be hydrocarbon type carbons. But as long as that's the case, you've got yourself an ether. Uh, whatever happened to alkyl halides? I guess I'm doing them at the end. Okay, uh, let's now uh, discuss the carbonyl group. I don't know how comfortable I am calling the carbonyl group by itself a functional group. I guess it kind of is, but I, I'm not entirely comfortable. But the carbonyl group is kind of a, a common factor amongst many functional groups. So I wouldn't say that a compound is a carbonyl. That's not correct. You can say a compound has a carbonyl functional group. And after that, you'll no doubt go on to say the compound is a ketone, is an aldehyde, is an ester whichever of these functional groups uh, it happens to have that contains a carbonyl. But I, I'm not real comfortable calling a carbonyl group itself a functional group. It's more like a common feature of several functional groups. And that's what we'll get into next is the different carbonyl containing functional groups. Uh, first one I'd like to cover is the aldehyde functional group. It's a funny word, A-L-D-E-H-Y-D-E, -E, aldehyde. And so the aldehyde functional group is defined as a hydrocarbon type carbon uh, connected to a carbonyl that on the other side, we have a hydrogen. So that's what defines an aldehyde. It's a carbonyl with one R group and one hydrogen. In this case, it actually is allowed for the, for the R group to be hydrogen. So the smallest possible aldehyde, you've heard of it. It's called formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is CH2O. That's the smallest possible aldehyde. But you can have any sort of alkyl group you want on it. Let's just go crazy. Also, don't forget the CHO group may be on the other side. Oh, and another thing I'll just let you know, it's, there's, there's lots of times abbreviations for these functional groups. The aldehyde functional group is generally abbreviated CHO. So you might see RCHO, or if it's written on the other side of the molecule, you'll see OHCR if it's coming off the left-hand side of the molecule. I don't really care if you use these abbreviations, but I do expect you to recognize them. So that's the way that aldehydes are usually abbreviated, is CHO. Why do we write CHO and not COH? Perfectly good question. Probably most of you are wondering that, if not all. The reason is if we wrote RCOH, it would look like an alcohol. So that's why we write RCHO. So like I said, I don't care if you use these abbreviations or not. That's up to you. But I do expect that when you see them, you understand them. It's, it's a common abbreviation for the aldehyde group. So I could, for instance, have written all this business and then CHO. Uh, but, you know, you can have whatever weird molecule you want. Here we go. Let's go crazy. Let's go absolutely crazy. So there you go. A uh, molecule happens to be called the P-anisaldehyde or para-anisaldehyde. Not that I really care if you know that. So that molecule would be an aldehyde, an aromatic compound, and an ether. It would have three functional groups. And you can buy that stuff commercially. So those are aldehydes, anything that contains that type of carbonyl containing functional group. Closely related to aldehydes are ketones. Spelling pet peeve number two, there is no Y in ketone, please and thank you. K-E-T-O-N-E, -E. get that all the time, ketone, please. Anyway, the ketone functional group also contains uh, a carbonyl group. And it's similar to an aldehyde, except that there are two hydrocarbon groups, one on either side of the carbonyl group. And here we do require that these R groups cannot be hydrogen. And I don't think these are arbitrary rules that you need to memorize. I think you'll immediately see if either of those R groups is a hydrogen, you don't have a ketone, you've got an aldehyde. 
So we need both of them to be, uh, to be hydrocarbon groups. The simplest possible ketone is called acetone. Those of you going on to take the lab portion of this class will probably get to use acetone to wash your glassware in lab. You can also find some acetone in certain types of paint thinners. I believe you'll find it in nail polish remover. It's in things like that. It's a relatively benign compound. I wouldn't go taking a bath in it or drinking it, certainly. But it's, it's not, there, there are certainly worse compounds than, than, uh, than acetone. Uh, cyclic ketones certainly exist. If the five-membered uh, uh, carbocycle is called cyclopentane, because pentane is five carbons, so if that's cyclopentane, then I'm sure it will come as no surprise that that molecule is cyclopentanone. And again, I don't really care if you know this. I'm just mentioning the names in case you're curious. We'll learn how to name certain molecules pretty soon, I believe in chapter two. But any, any sort of combination, the, the two groups don't have to be the same. You could have something like that. That would also be a ketone. So any, uh, any carbonyl containing compound of that type with two hydrocarbon groups on either side of the carbon is a ketone. Uh, after that, hmm, I'm going to keep in the order in my notes because I think I'm going in the same order as your book, and I think that might be helpful. Uh, other carbonyl containing functional groups. Next one is the carboxylic acid functional group. And the carboxylic acid functional group is of this type. It's a carbonyl group connected to some group R on one side, connected to OH on the other. So like I mentioned before, carboxylic acids are not alcohols. Having that carbonyl group there changes everything. And of course, it still is an OH. There are some similarities between alcohols and carboxylic acids. You would probably guess for both of them that a base of sufficient strength would pull off that proton. And that is true, it would. I think you'll also find you don't need nearly as strong a base to deprotonate a carboxylic acid. They're, oh golly, easily a trillion times more acidic than alcohols, other things being equal. We'll eventually get to why that is, because we've got a whole chapter on uh, carboxylic acids and related molecules. But any molecule of that type is a carboxylic acid. Uh, you can also see it abbreviated RCO2H or RCOOH. Should this be on the other side of the molecule, I would expect you still to recognize it. Uh, the, if, if you see the abbreviation on the other side, it becomes HO2C or uh, HOOC. That's how it would look like if it's on the left side of the molecule. All of these are acceptable abbreviations for the carboxylic acid functional group. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. I just expect that you understand it when you do see it. Uh, okay, so we'll put it over here for now. Sorry, chat. Anyway, uh, the simplest possible carboxylic acid is where R is hydrogen, that is allowed. That compound is called formic acid, it's pretty nasty. You find it in bee and ant venom, for instance, it's very irritating. Uh, much more common in a carboxylic acid that you'll have heard of is where the R group is a methyl group. I just sort of changed it into that with a few strokes of the pen. So that's acetic acid. Uh, and you'll find acetic acid in vinegar. Pretty much any kind of vinegar is a solution that contains, oh, maybe four or 5% acetic acid. But you can, uh, I mean, aromatic carboxylic acids are a thing. This guy is benzoic acid. You find that along with naphthalene and mothballs. Do people still use mothballs? I don't even know. I, I, I remember when I was a kid walking into my parents' closet and smelled of mothballs. I don't know if people still do that. Uh, so, um, or you can have an alkyl chain of whatever arbitrarily, whatever arbitrary length you want. That would also be a carboxylic acid. Infinite varieties exist, but anything of that type is a carboxylic acid. Uh, somewhat related to carboxylic acids are the ester functional group. And my third and final pet peeve with spelling, there is no H in this ester 
This is not the biblical Esther. E-S-T-E-R, please and thank you. And I would say that Esther's fall into the category R1, C double bond O, O, R2. So an ester is essentially uh, the condensation product of a carboxylic acid with an alcohol. And that, that's actually how they're made industrially, or at least one way of making esters. Esters show up quite a bit uh, in nature, pretty much any fruit or flower or something like that that smells nice, it's probably smelling nice because of an ester. Usually those are the, those are the molecules that are responsible for that. So the simplest possible ester, I guess, would be methyl formate. We are going to allow that one to be a hydrogen, but we do need at least one carbon for R2. That's the smallest ester you can get your hands on. But, you know, you can have anything. Let's even go crazy and draw it in the other direction. So this would also be an ester. Do you see how it has C double bond O, O alkyl? So that makes it fall into the same category. That would also be an ester. Aromatic esters are a thing. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so much then for that. Where are we at in terms of time? 2.30, 2.31. I got nine minutes. I think we will make it. Good. Any questions on any of those? Unfortunately, I have to disappear everything, but I just want to make sure that everyone catches up. So hopefully you're getting the idea. This is, oh, uh, over there, yes. <laughs> I, I don't have a list of which can be H and which can't be. But again, you don't need a list like that because sometimes if you try to make them an H, you'll get a different functional group. For example, the R groups on the ketone can't be H because if it is, you don't have a ketone, you have an aldehyde. Uh, I, I mean that you can't substitute H for either of these R groups and still get a ketone. Because if you try to make it an H, then you get this. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, only because I don't want to cause confusion, let me go back and show you which ones can be H and which ones can't. Is that kind of what you're asking? No, it's not what you're asking. Oh, well, they all can be hydrocarbons. Which, in other words, which ones can be H, right? I see what you're saying. R groups can always be hydrocarbon groups. That's always an option. Always. There are no exceptions. Sometimes they can also be H. The way, by H, I just mean being a hydrogen. And the way you know it can't be a hydrogen is if you put a hydrogen in and you get a different functional group. Like if you tried to put an H in here for a ketone, you no longer have a ketone. You have an aldehyde. And, and the way you know that is by studying the function. I don't expect you to know it right now. But the way you know that is by studying functional groups and working with them. Is that kind of what you meant? Oh, good. OK. Just wanted to make sure I answered your question. Yes. So an another one for ethers. These two R groups have to be hydrocarbon groups. They can't be H's. Because if you, if you make one of these R groups H, you've got an alcohol, not an ether. So it's not like an arbitrary thing. There's always a good reason when they can't be H. It's because you get a different functional group. Good, no good question. Other questions then? The people behind me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the few, the proud. <laughs> okay. Let's try to draw this to a close then. We're, all, we're almost done. We've done the majority of them. Uh, another functional group is called the amine functional group. And amines are organic derivatives of ammonia. Organic derivatives of ammonia. And you know, ammonia is NH3. Uh, I am never happy with the, oh, I didn't even know you could do that. I just drew with my finger. I had no idea. Uh, but I'm never happy with how they define amines. Let me show you how I like to define amines. To me, an amine is a molecule of this type. 
It's a nitrogen with at least one hydrocarbon group attached. The other two bonds to nitrogen, because of course nitrogen likes to have three bonds and one lone pair, right, for a formal charge of zero. The other two bonds can be to either hydrogens or hydrocarbon groups, but you do need at least one hydrocarbon group. Could also have two or three hydrocarbon groups, but you need at least one. And I think you'll see why. If R is H, then you've got ammonia. Ammonia is not organic. So you do need at least one. I think that's the clearest way of defining amines. I think that you can go a lot further with that than with the way they usually define it. So the simplest possible amine would be methylamine. And again, I really don't care if you memorize that's what it's called, but it does have a name. So that's the smallest possible amine. You need at least one carbon or you don't have an amine, but you can have a whole bunch of these and maybe a hydrogen over here, or maybe a third one of those groups. That would also be an amine. It can be incorporated into a ring. Something like that, maybe, would also be an amine. It just happens to be a cyclic amine. So anything of that type, any organic derivative of ammonia is going to be, you do need at least one hydrocarbon group. So the R can't be a carbonyl type. We'll get to that next. Those are called anids. But, but there do, does need to be at least one hydrocarbon group. The other two can be H's. They can also be hydrocarbon groups, but you do need at least that one hydrocarbon group or you don't have yourself an amine. The similar spelled amide uh, is kind of a similar thing, except it includes a carbonyl. So any compound of this type, or it can face the other direction as well. I don't want that to throw you off. Not to forget my lone pairs. So anything of that type is an amide. And again, these two bonds to nitrogen can be either hydrogen or hydrocarbon groups. Either way is fine. But you do need the carbonyl for it to be an amide. This R group likewise can be either H or hydrocarbon. So an example of an amide might be something like this. That would be an example of an amide. And the way you know it's an amide is because you see a carbonyl group with either H or a hydrocarbon group on one side and an amino group of some kind on the other. That's an amide. So it's, it's sort of like an amine, but one of the attached groups is a carbonyl. So that, that's how you tell the difference. Amines do not have carbonyls. Amides do have carbonyls. That's how you can tell the difference. And I think that's almost it at least for nitrogen containing compounds. We're really scraping the bottom of the barrel, which is good because I have about two minutes left. Uh, I need to do, uh, I wanna do nitriles, alkyl halides, and if I can actually squeeze it in a couple of sulfur containing groups. I, I can also maybe leave you to read about nitriles in your own, but I'll just mention, nit the definition of a nitrile is it contains C triple bond N. So it's the only, uh, uh, it, it's sort of an organic derivative of uh, hydrogen cyanide, which is quite a bit toxic, as you know. The simplest possible nitrile would be this one, CH3, C triple bond N. But this CH3 can be any hydrocarbon group. It can't be hydrogen because then you have hydrogen cyanide. That's not considered organic. But you need at least one hydrocarbon type carbon over here in order to have a nitrile. Uh, alkyl halides are exactly what they sound like. It's any type of compound, you could say Rx, where X is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. If you have one or more uh, halogen molecules attached, you've got yourself an alkyl halide. So go as nuts as you like. That would be an example of an alkyl halide. Even if it just did one chlorine atom, it would be an alkyl halide. So as long as you have at least one halogen atom attached, you've got yourself an alkyl halide. And the other two are just sulfur versions of alcohols and ethers. So you've got the thiol functional group, which is basically RSH instead of ROH. 
Believe me, those stink to high heaven. Ever smelled a skunk? I'm sure you have. Contains thiols. Uh, but R can be any hydrocarbon group. Again, R can't be hydrogen because then you have hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is inorganic. So you do need at least one hydrocarbon type carbon. And last but not least, the sulfide or thioether functional group. I don't really care which, which you call it. Is just like ether is accepted to sulfur instead of an oxygen. Other than that, the same rules apply. The reason the sulfur ones matter will sometimes run into functional groups containing sulfur in the chapter on proteins and polypeptides. Other than that, uh, it's 2.40 and I've run out of time. So I'll leave it there. And I believe we're now ready to start chapter two, finally getting out of chapter one. Other than that, have a great day. I'll see you all on Friday.